Good evening and welcome to another edition of Special Assignment. I'm your host, Ashraf Garda. Tonight we bring you part two of the Con in Conservation, a two-part series looking at the captive lion breeding and hunting industry. In this episode, we'll look at the trade in lion bones to the Asian market, how the industry is being regulated, and we ask this question, is the African lion bordering on extinction? Tonight's program was produced by Rochelle seaton Rogers, And a word of warning, some visuals in this program may offend sensitive viewers. Few people know that the lion is facing a similar fate to the rhino. Lion bones are being used to replace tiger bones in making traditional tiger bone wine, as well as for cures, such as for ailments such as arthritis. The Chinese, having emptied the forests of Asia of their tigers, are now turning to the plains of Africa, and they're going to empty the plains of Africa of our lions as well. Why is the South African government trying so hard to stop the trade in rhino horn to the Asian market, yet allowing farmers to flood the very same market with lion bones? If it's going to be an unsustainable practice and so forth, we will definitely look into it. Is the African lion heading towards extinction? In the last 20 years, the wild lion population has decreased by more than 80%. And is the permitting system being abused illegally? We've been told, yes, you can shoot now and, and uh, do the paperwork later. In part one of the Con in Conservation, we informed the public that canned hunting is still taking place in South Africa. But virtually all hunting in South Africa is canned hunting to a greater or lesser degree. Uh, all trophy hunting takes place in fenced camps of smaller or larger extent. We explained the stress that most lion cubs are under when they're handled by tourists who flock to play with them. They get so much stressed related illnesses. They get diarrhea, they vomit. It's, it is just incredible. And we revealed that most of these cute cubs are ending up in so-called canned hunts, despite the fact that they're acclimatized to being around humans. These cute cuddly cubs um, that can be photographed and played with get to a certain point where they are too big to be picked up and cuddled and played with and they start becoming dangerous. What happens to them? And sadly most of those gets, cubs get sold onto hunting organizations. The NSPCA, which deals with animal welfare issues, has expressed its concern about lions being bred in captivity. These animals are now being intensively farmed, so you're getting severe welfare concerns because costs are cut in order to increase profits. So things happen with the cubs. Some of the cubs are raised on incorrect formulas because the proper formulas are far too expensive, so you get extreme um, nutritional problems with the cubs. Also, there's extensive inbreeding that happens at these facilities because it doesn't matter the quality of the animal as long as they just breed as many as possible. So how much money is the industry making? We phoned around acting as someone interested in a lion hunt. The life cycle of one captive bread lion can make its captors hundreds of thousands, if not millions. Cubs make money by being petted by tourists and hand-raised by paying volunteers. When older, people can pay to walk with them. When they're taken to breeding farms, females become cub breeding machines, while most males end up in hunts. In death, the lion bones can be sold to the Asian market. But the breeders are not shy of the fact that they're exploiting the lion for profit. People farm with lions as with sheep, with goats, with game, with kudu, with sable, with buffalo, to make money, to exploit the African lion for commercial reasons is just as valid as exploiting the buffalo or the roan antelope or the sable. 
Most people know about the plight of the rhino being poached for its horn, which is believed to have medicinal properties like curing cancer, fever and headaches. But fewer people know that the African lion is facing a similar fate. Traditional Chinese medicine, which was using tiger bones, has turned to lion bones because the tiger is so endangered. So as we understand, the lion bones are being used to replace tiger bones in making traditional tiger bone wine, as well as for cures, such as for ailments such as arthritis. Until recently, the bones of uh, hunted lions were just uh, dumped somewhere on the farm. But uh, then the Asian market got uh, aware of that, and that changed everything. He just buys the, the carcass for around about 20, 25,000 rand. But may I emphasize that all those activities are very closely and strictly regulated by CITES permits. Activists and conservationists believe that the lion bone trade will decrease the welfare standards even more of lions bred in captivity. So, traditional medicine trade and there's no proof behind the traditional medicine and these animals are being grown to full adult size. It doesn't matter what condition the animals are in as long as their skeleton is full size. So you're getting even more welfare concerns for the lions that in, the end destination is the lion bone wine industry. Permits have been issued to lion breeders to euthanize their lions specifically for, for the bone trade. People fighting the industry say that fueling the demand for lion bones will soon start to spill over to wild lion populations of Africa. The lion bone trade is a, a, a dreadful threat to our wild lion populations because that trade is starting to take off now and it's gr going to grow exponentially. Now the Chinese having emptied the forests of Asia of their tigers are now turning to the plains of Africa and they're going to empty the plains of Africa of our lions as well uh, because uh, the um, traditional Chinese medicine uh, practitioners believe that the bones of a wild lion are more potent than those of a captive bred lion. It is not true. The market is there and it has been there for centuries and those people are going to get what they want. If the legal trade is closed, then the way they will get it illegally and then poaching becomes an option. The export of the lion bones, of a lion that has been hunted, is as a byproduct of the hunt. And, um, and it's legal and it's sustainable and there's a demand for it. There's no proof whatsoever that the, that the trade in lion bones has been to the detriment <coughs> of our wild lions in South Africa at all, so I don't see any reason why it should be banned. Chris Mercer is concerned that the lion's plight is being overshadowed by the plight of the rhino when he says they go hand in hand. There are so many other uh, important, equally important issues which are pr currently being neglected because everybody's focusing on the rhinos. Uh, lions are every bit as endangered as rhino. The rhino in South Africa is in this desperate situation that it is because of the ban on the trade in rhino horn 35 years back. And if we are going to close down on the, on the legal lion bone trade, we are just going to think pleasurely about lines 30 years from now. And we will see them on pictures. Up next, we dig deeper into the suspicious activities of a lion farm and look at how the industry is regulated. In part one, special assignment uncovered that some tourists are being conned into belief that when they pay to hand raise lion cubs in the name of conservation, it's just a money making scam. Last time we spoke to two international volunteers who paid tens of thousands of rands to do this at the Boskopi Lion and Tiger Reserve in the Free State. It was only when I started doing my own research that I found out that there were uh, links to places that 
have been in the media for canned hunting? Well, if you're, when you start Googling him, you'll quickly find out that he was a couple of years ago convicted for involvement in a rhino poaching syndicate. The issues that sparked the volunteers' suspicion of the farm can be found in news articles. Peter Jr., who's involved with Boss Kopi, owned by his parents, Peter Sr. and Ingrid Swart, was found transporting lions illegally, and he's been convicted of being involved in a rhino poaching syndicate. Since the last program, a third volunteer from Boss Kopi's come forward, saying that there's signs at the farm that cubs are not bred for conservation, but just to supply the hunting industry, because in that industry, males are much more valuable. On one occasion, when there was male lions born in that litter, the boss actually bought them really around the drinks because he was happy they were males. Previously to that, we had a lot of females and no drinks were on the hand. He also tells us how the actions of the owners after the deaths of some tiger cubs also made volunteers question the motives of the farm. They were skinned, the flesh was taken off and the bones were never seen again, nor were they hides. But these were hand-reared cubs, which I was involved in. They were basically treated as a commodity, which I don't think was the right thing to do when you have an animal which you're basically hand-rearing to be treated as a family animal, and that, in that sense, you would probably want to cremate it or bury the animal, show a bit more respect rather than using the bones, the hide or whatever for financial gain. He thinks that paying volunteers should be told the truth. The actual owners up front should say that this is what's going to happen. You, you are involved with handling these lions, tigers, whatever it is, and the end purpose is this, then we'll see if the numbers drop and they lose their income as such from volunteers. We phoned the owners of Boss Copy to request an interview, but we were told that they didn't want to speak to us. We also sent through an email to the farm with our questions in writing. We have still not received a response. With the allegations unanswered, one is left to ask questions about the activities at the farm. The captive breeding and handling of lions also poses other risks, like human safety. Recently, there have been numerous attacks on people at lion farms where lions can be handled. At Ukatula Lion Farm in the northwest, a man was mauled by a young male lion. At the Maholo Holo Center, two lions attempted to pull a volunteer into their enclosure. Conservationists say this is what happens when wild animals are put in situations they shouldn't be. Unfortunately, the laws that are in place generally protect lions that are in the wild, not so much lions that are in captivity. So there's a big gap. Um, also, some of the animal welfare laws, when they were created, wild animals weren't kept in captivity. So we're having a problem where wild animals' needs are not being met in captivity, yet the laws don't adequately protect them. The regulation of lions gets confusing because there's no standardization across the country and the regulation is split between two different departments. Wild lions are handled by the Department of Environmental Affairs and captive bred lions fall under the Department of Agriculture because they're considered farm animals. Let's compare the Free State to the Northwest. In the Free State, a lion enclosure must be at least one hectare in size. A lion to be hunted must be released onto the farm three months prior to the hunt and no hunting with a bow is allowed. In the northwest, the enclosure only has to be 12 by 12 meters, and the lion only needs to be released 96 hours or four days before the hunt, and hunting with a bow is allowed. Unfortunately, the department does not have a mandate to regulate or address welfare matters. Um, it is the mandate of the Department of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries, and um, these issues should be addressed with them to come up with protocols or norms and standards in terms of the keeping and the handling of lions in captivity. There are enormous problems in conservation in South Africa. Very few people realize how dysfunctional the system is. You have sand parks, you have the National Department of the Environment, and then you have the provincial uh, conservation structures. Uh, all of which are different from each other. In 2007, the Department of Environmental Affairs won a court case requiring lions bred by humans to be released onto a game farm for two years before they're hunted in an attempt to remove the human imprinting on them. But on appeal, the Predator Breeders Association had the judgment overturned. Now a captive bred lion can be hunted in four days after its release. It would have killed off 
the total line industry. No line farmer can afford to let a line run free for 24 months because it will devour about 500,000 rands wild animals in that, that time. Karen Trendler says that the permitting system makes it difficult to track how many cubs end up in trophy hunts. Chatting to conservation officers, you realize that it's the permitting system that facilitates it in that if you buy a lion cub from somewhere in Gauteng and you're moving it to your facility in Northwest Province, you need a transport permit and you need a purchase permit for that lion. It doesn't state that that animal is going to be hunted. The issuing of the hunting permit might happen two weeks later, three months later. So there's no link between the sale of those animals and the issuing of a hunting permit. Four Paws says that through its own investigations, they found that some farms allow hunts to take place illegally without the proper permits in place if the hunt is in a rush. We've actually um, been to various breeding farms where we've inquired is, whether it's possible or not to do a hunt. Um, and uh, yes, we've been told, yes, you can shoot now and, and uh, do the paperwork later. I'm not aware of anybody allowing people to hunt lions and then only apply for permits afterwards. If there are cases like that, those specific cases should definitely be brought under the attention of nature conservation as well as um, FASA so we can look into it because it's, it's um, abusing the permit system and it's illegal. So who's monitoring the hunts? The National Department um, doesn't oversee hunts on private um, reserves or private farms. Um, the Provincial Conservation Authority can, if, if they have the capacity and there's a need for it, they can supervise hunts. To my knowledge, um, I'm only aware of the Northern Cape. They currently oversee hunts. Coming up is the African lion bordering on extinction. The populations of most big cats has declined drastically in the past 50 years. Specifically in South Africa, it's estimated that there are only 2,800 lions left in the wild, while there are between 5 and 6,000 lions in captivity. So why is the lion listed as only vulnerable and not endangered? I don't think there's any reason to, to put them onto the endangered. It's a, it's a scientist to two species and um, I think they're well protected and well cared for. There's absolutely no doubt about it that they should be uh, listed as Appendix 1 on CITES. Um, there have been efforts by animal welfare organisations uh, to effect that, but the hunting industry is so powerful that they've been able to defeat uh, those efforts. Despite the South African government saying they don't feel the lion is in any danger, the United States government is currently assessing the situation of the lion and looking at whether it needs to be listed as endangered in their country. This would stop the exporting of lion parts as trophies to the US, one of the biggest nations hunting lions for trophies in South Africa. So can captive bred lions help to save the declining wild lion populations if there's found to be a need? Many people say that uh, captive breeding is, is supposed to be supporting conservation um, by keeping wild lion populations um, you know, stable and healthy by preventing the poaching, but that in fact is not happening. The studies have shown that uh, lions born in captivity and bred in captivity cannot be released back into the wild. Conservationists say that the genetics of captive bred lions are also considered to be unhealthy because of the inbreeding on farms, which would make them unsuitable to be released back into the wild. But some research sent to the US Commission, looking at the lion's status, says that lions are not endangered and in fact there's no more land left for the population to expand. In the case of the African lion, they dependent on uh, protected area systems where there are sufficient habitat available to them and prey base for them to feed on and so forth. And they don't coexist very well with, with humans. So you get human wildlife conflict situations where lion is then driven out of their areas um, to avoid that, or to avoid life, loss of life and livestock. So in terms of the size of the population, it might sound like that it's a small population, but they are well established in the protected area system. 
The Professional Hunters Association says that hunting has contributed to the general conservation of wildlife in South Africa and that when it was outlawed in Kenya, wildlife populations declined. If you uh, look four or five decades ago in the 1960s, we've had approximately an estimated half a million head of game in South Africa. Today we, we have 20 million head of game in South Africa, even more. Now people say, you know what, you can't contribute that all to hunting, and that's true. But hunting um, as a manage, wildlife management tool, sustainable utilization, that's what it's all about. And, and because of hunting and because of private ownership, our wildlife has grown tremendously in South Africa. And there is no ways that any hunter would um, like to see any species ever become extinct for whatever reason. Oh, that's typical hunting industry nonsense. Remember that this is an enormously powerful industry. Uh, if you look at the board of trustees, for example, of Safari Club International, you'll see people who are presidents and ex-presidents and some of the biggest names in the world there. So this is an organization which is obscenely wealthy and enormously uh, connected politically all over the world. Uh, they will, for example, pay some of the smartest brains in the world to come up with mantras like if it, if it pays, it stays, and give it a value and it will be preserved, and other nonsensical mantras which make no sense and cannot stand up to analysis, but people believe them. The captive bred lion and hunting industry also says that it contributes to the economy of South Africa and that outlawing it would have negative impacts for the country. Even in the judgment, the judge stated that this industry brings a large amount of money into the country, that it has economic value, that it provides jobs. But really, if you look at it, so does child pornography, but it doesn't make it right. And it's exactly the same with lion hunting, canned lion hunting, it's not ethically right. The hunting industry in general shies away from the term ethical. Not, not only us, but the hunting fraternity in general. Uh, it is actually an expression of your value system. And in South Africa and in the, in the world for that matter, everyone has its own set of values. The breeders say that people get too emotional about lions thinking it's an African icon when they're just like other animals. That uh, icon status has been enhanced by the films that we got from Uncle Disney. Pictures like, like that create the impression that a lion is almost human. Canned hunting and the trade in lion bones should be outlawed because they have absolutely no place in our civilized society at this point in time. Uh, ki killing lions for, for sport, uh, who have been hand raised uh, by, by people and who are so accustomed to people, there's, there's no, no fair chance um, for the lion. And of course the, the trade in lion, in lion bones, which it's clear has no medicinal value whatsoever. Where they've said that lion bones perhaps could, could be a cure for, for such ailments such as arthritis. Some of the lions sitting here behind me actually have arthritis due to the fact that they've been hand raised and, and uh, are suffering from malnourishment in those first years by not receiving mother's milk. I'd like your views on this issue, and you can do this in one of three ways. That's via Twitter, Facebook, or email. Finally, I've picked out two comments from last week's show. That was part one of the canned line industry. Now, Drew Abramson Facebooked, the public needs to see what is going on and what they are contributing to when they visit cub patting facilities or go walking with lions. And Yuvika Suku tweeted, if Kenya can put a ban on canned hunting, then so can South Africa. Well, that's it for tonight. Join us again next week when we point out the issues that matter. <laughs>